Well, I want to welcome everyone to this Environmental Law Summit, and I want to thank Eric Hall and all of his uh, team uh, of students, faculty, and staff who have put this together. Yeah, annually, it's, it's been such a successful conference, and just by the uh, registration, it would appear this is one of the uh, more successful ones. Uh, I want to welcome you, you all. Uh, those of you from the school and those of you from other places uh, within the region and outside the region. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an emerging scientific consensus uh, that the world is changing rapidly. And when, when you think about that, you think, well, uh, so what else is new? The world is always changing. But I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir when I say it's changing rapidly. And uh, changes in weather patterns and elevations in sea levels around the world pose significant threats uh, to the environment and to human security. These changes are expected to impact the availability of food and water in some areas, which would, could impact human health, cause mass migration, and lead to civil unrest. Elevations at sea level pose substantial challenges to coastal communities such as Jacksonville to prepare response strategies and to make wiser choices regarding future land use and development. Emerging evidence shows that the chemistry of the ocean is changing rapidly. Direct impacts on organisms and communities have been observed, including impacts on Florida's shellfish and coral reef systems. In a recent study examining how these changes in ocean chemistry may impact communities throughout the country, the authors concluded that Florida was one of 15 coastal states in danger of suffering significant economic impacts. Recently, ministers from 195 countries adopted by consensus a legally binding agreement to fight climate change. The Paris Agreement aimed to help the world abandon fossil fuel fuels this century and specifically stop global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and if possible below 1.5 degrees. The parties agreed to accelerate climate action coalition, uh, excuse me, the, agreed to accelerate the climate action coalition agreed in, in Paris between government cities, business and investors and to strengthen the, weak, the link between climate change and sustainable development. However, the status of U.S. action on this issue is anything but clear after the U.S. Supreme Court recently issued a stay preventing immediate implementation of the Clean Power Plan. The EPA's signature climate action plan to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide in the United States. Today's speakers bring a wealth of knowledge to the Environmental Summit and will share their insights into how Florida and the rest of the country can respond to these and other threats to our environmental and personal security. And I'll close with just a comment. 35 years ago, I was taking a class in environmental law. Uh, our law school was probably one of the first in the country to have such a class. In that class, we were convinced that through the use of regula regulations and a partnership with science, we could solve the problems of um, environmental damage. However, 35 years later, it's becoming more and more clear that it's more than just science and regulation. We have to uh, get fully engaged in the, the notion that science may give us the ability to modify the earth, but it doesn't teach us how we should use the earth. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Thomas Berry back in the 70s, back when I took this course, who started to uh, lead a movement on this, saying that we, we owe it to the earth to take care of it, it is ours, and it's a matter of how we use it, not necessarily how we develop the science. And so as you go through your deliberations today, I urge you to consider um, all means to achieve these ends in terms of collaboration and focus on 
on the value of the earth and what it means to mankind. And with that, I'll close and wish you the best of luck in your deliberations. Thank you, Dennis. Good morning and welcome to the 17th annual Northeast Florida Environmental Summit. My name is Jacqueline Blair and I'm the president of the Environmental Law Society and a second year law student here at Florida Coastal. It is with great pleasure to introduce the opening address. Dr. Harold Wanless is professor and chair of the Department of Geological Sciences and was a Cooper Fellow in the College of Arts and Sciences from 2010 to 2013. Since joining the University of Miami in 1971, he and his students have been studying the dynamics and evolution of tropical, shallow, marine, and coastal environments of South Florida and the Bahamas. Especially important to this research has been documenting the influence of changing sea level and catastrophic events such as hurricanes. They are now using this understanding to, pre to better predict the future of our coastal environments in the face of global warming and to project future rates of sea level rise. He completed a bachelor's in geology at Princeton University in 64 with a thesis on the beach sands of Molokai, Hawaii. His master's degree was in marine geology and geophysics at the University of Miami in 67 with a thesis on Holocene Sediments and Paleo-Environmental Evolution of the Biscayne Bay, Florida. His PhD in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at John Hopkins University was completed in 1973 with a dissertation on the geology and paleo-environmental reconstruction of the Cambrian sedimentary sequences of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Without further ado, Dr. Carol Wanless. Thank you very much for having me. Um, President Stone eloquently described the problem before us. And let me just point out that there is a handout that I give out of talks. It's, I see it along the middle aisle. If anybody doesn't have one, you can get one. It's a summary of many aspects of things that I probably won't have time to cover. Let me start by making sure you understand what sea level, what climate change is. You all know that it is the, the short wavelengths and all the wavelengths of the sun coming in through the atmosphere and bouncing off the surface of the earth at a longer wavelength because we're cooler than the sun. And being caught, these longer wavelengths of radiation being caught by the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, water, and so on, and turned into heat. If that were the end of the story, it would be an easy solution. Quit putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and get the excess that's there out. The problem is that over 93% of the global warming heat, the heat produced since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the extra heat, over 93% has been transferred to the ocean. And as you all know from high school physics or college physics, that water has an immense capacity to take in and hold heat, and that's exactly what's happening. Most disturbing, half of the heat that is in the ocean because of human-induced global warming has gone in there since 19. 1997. We are not getting hold of the problem as India and Greenland and not Greenland and India, China are, are industrializing and as populations in the world are growing, we are putting more and more and more greenhouse gases in at a faster state. You can also see in the lower four little dots there that a lot of this heat or the significant amount of heat is going in to warm and melt ice. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, we have been warming the atmosphere and the ocean. We have been pumping excess gas in. It was slow at first, but it's accelerating the buildup. Sea level similarly has been rising. We now know that sea level did a lot of its rising because of warming the ocean, and that as you warm the water, it's expanding. Okay, and this is a attempt by the inter inter 
governmental panel on climate change in their 2007 report to reconstruct global sea level. This is about like Florida sea level, because Florida is not especially sinking or rising. And uh, as you can see, we had a, had a significant rise uh, since about 1930. And you can see it's sped up again since 1990. That's when ice melt in Greenland and Antarctica kicked in. Um, we've had about a foot rise since 1930, and that's not trivial. Even though we have a governor and our junior senator seem to be denying climate change, it's real, and since 2009, all the U.S. government agencies have had to incorporate meaningful sea level rise projections into their civil works projects, past, present, and future. This is a graph put out in uh, 2012 as part of the United States National Climate Assessment. It's uh, four scenarios. One, the lower one, the linear historical, would only be about 20 centimeters, about eight inches by the end of the century of sea level rise. We're already beyond that. You saw in the last slide we were running at over 30 centimeters, over a foot. What they call the intermediate low has ice melt but no acceleration. And the ice melt we're seeing on Greenland and Antarctica, and that comes out to only about one foot eight inches. These projections are not meaningful for looking to the future because ice melt is an acceleration. And I have, in the past week, several people say, well, somebody else says it's only going to be two or three feet by the end of the century. Yeah, that's because they are not incorporating ice melt acceleration into their projections. We'll talk more about that later. That leaves us with the upper two projections, what they call the intermediate high that has continued expansion of the ocean with warming and limited ice melt acceleration. And then the higher one, two meters, 6.6 .6 feet by the end of the century is, is ocean warming plus the largest modeled ice melt acceleration. And I emphasize model because their models do not incorporate a great many of the accelerating <coughs> reinforcing feedbacks we are seeing for ice melt on Greenland and Antarctica. <coughs> My extremely strong recommendation to communities is plan with the 6.6 .6 foot by the end of the century. It's real. We're going to get there anyhow. Let's say we're five feet at the end of the century. This is an acceleration. We have warmed the ocean. Ice melt is going to be accelerating into the next century and maybe beyond because we've warmed the ocean. And uh, if we're at five feet at the end of the century, sea level will be rising, according to these graphs, at a foot per decade. You know, try to manage any coastal environment, urban or otherwise, with that kind of rise. This projection could be two feet by 2048, three feet by 2065. Two feet, that's barely a mortgage cycle away. And I should point out, that the real tide records that we gained by tide gauges in the red and now since about the early 90s and by satellite measurement, we've measured the world's ocean elevation change by satellite and it's been challenged of course and worked very well. We're rising at the high end of all the projections. That's very important to understand. I, I have nice maps of South Florida. Your area is also very low. And I apologize, I don't have, have good maps of you, but you can get the feeling of when everybody in South Florida is going to move up to live near you. So, um, I've put Coral Gables on. Um, Mayor Jim Kaysen has become very involved in mapping their community, our community, and figuring out the differences of changes in infrastructure that have to be implemented with each six inches of sea level rise so that you can have a functional community. And he's also figuring out at what point it's no longer economically feasible to maintain an integrated infrastructure. And that's an important thing to do, and that's what most communities are not doing because they're afraid the tax base will collapse as people start to see the reality. But wouldn't that be nice if we knew our future a little bit? There's no reason we shouldn't. You can see Miami Beach on the right and Key Biscayne down on the bottom. And I think I can use this. Can you see this on the uh, 
TV screens there? Yeah. Okay. Um, get on there too. This is Turkey Point where FPNL is trying to put in two new nuclear power plants uh, units to meet the growing population later in the century. Well, this is Miami. You can we already have a wet Miami Beach, but you can see that it's it's uh, going to be getting wetter. Our billion-dollar tunnel, Miami International Airport, is in the Miami River Valley, and just a two-foot rise starts to compromise these things. Here's the four and six-foot rise by the end of the century. The six-foot rise is interesting because we have about 44 percent of the original land area that was shown in the first diagram uh, present, but Three-fourths of what's there is less than two feet above normal high tide. These maps are just normal high tide, not king tides and so on. Miami is such a beautiful place to live, but look how low we are. It's just unbelievable. And we're not alone in this. You know, we're really not alone in this. And, uh, but this is where we're headed. This is where we're headed. We have to stop the input of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We have to start pulling them out. But we've warmed the ocean. This is where we are headed. And the models do not know how to include some of the feedbacks that we are seeing and the real nature of sea level rise, which I'll show you in a minute. On top of those maps, we're already, this is Miami Beach, every year, so many times a year, it was September, October, November, December, January, and a little bit in February of flooding during the full moon. Um, so we have these higher tides. I took Elizabeth Culver, she wrote a nice little article in the New Yorker in December. I took her out on a high tide in the end of September and, and we were walking among $10 million homes that were just being built and you had to go through knee deep seawater to get to them. Somehow it hasn't caught on. People were calling in saying there was a broken water main and they were also driving their cars through it like it was a broken fresh water main and it's not know much about seawater, they, you just ruined your alternator and starter motor and everything else. So sea level rise is happening, it's real. We've had about a foot of rise in Florida in the last century and it's accelerating. Okay. The other thing is that all these maps do not include the severity of storm surges, which are horrendous events. They're not just high water events, as you all know. And uh, this is Category 2 Hurricane Ike on the Boulevard Peninsula just east of Galveston in 2008. All the houses were taken out except one. Lynn and I went out there afterward uh, a couple of years later and we were down in Galveston in a meeting and it is built back denser than before because FEMA gives you money to build back but they could not use that money to move on somewhere else and that's unbelievable. South Florida, a lot of Florida, is underlain by a very porous limestone and sand. The Dutch are all over here trying to make money by helping us so they can fix their problems, but um, they're very upset that we have this porous limestone. We cannot play New Orleans and the Netherlands. Our rainwater goes right down through this limestone and the seawater will come right up through it. So we're a little different. The models on which the sea level projections I showed you are based are models, and as I mentioned, they are not sufficient. Um, sea ice decline is decades ahead of when models predicted. The melting of polar ice sheets may occur more rapidly than models predicted. This is Michael Mann, one of our great modelers, great climate scientists, seeing beyond the models. The models get the trends, but they don't get the rates. Let me just show you quickly Florida 120,000 years ago during the last interglacial. We had natural cycles of glacials and interglacials. And sea level was about 20 feet higher. Miami was a sandbar. And uh, the Florida Keys were a reef. Um, Jacksonville was, was in the ocean. And uh, then we went into an ice age and so much snow and fell and didn't melt on our continents that sea level went down 420 feet. Chicago was under a mile of ice and all that. And the important thing is how we got from there to today. It wasn't just a simple pickup and then slow down as the ice melted fast and then slow. 
what it was all across the continental shelf. We see these old barrier islands, old reefs, old coastal mud flats and marshes. All these, <coughs> excuse me, all these are former still stands of sea level that let a barrier island form. And then suddenly it was just abandoned and inundated by a very rapid pulse of sea level rise as some ice sheet sector disintegrated. And so what we see are these pulses of rise that are sort of, this is what this diagram is showing. These are the ones we've documented well so far. But it is not, it's just these pulses and pauses and pulses of problems. That's what happens when ice weakens. It rapidly disintegrates. That's what we're seeing the beginning of now. Let me show you another graph or so. This is going back over 400,000 years. The red is the carbon dioxide levels. We get this out of the bubbles trapped in the continental ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, you can see that these bubbles contain higher levels of carbon dioxide during the interglacials, about 280 parts per million. And during the glacial periods, CO2 was down to about 180 parts per million, did less warming. So we were in an ice age, 100 parts per million fluctuation over about the last 800,000 years. And um, sea level behaved accordingly. During the cool periods, the low CO2, sea level was down about 100 meters lower. During the warm periods, it was up at or above present level. And that's right where we were at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. That was a natural cycling, depending on how we were presenting ourselves to the sun, uh, which is cyclic, that is driving this. After the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we went up not even another, not just another 100 parts per million carbon dioxide, we've gone up almost 125 parts per million. More than double the level between the ice age and the interglacial. And what would you expect sea level response to be? Nothing? No, just look at this diagram. We really kicked the bucket over. We just figured out how much CO2 we can dig up and burn and put in the atmosphere. And that's the big question. And from what I've seen from the past, which I briefly showed you with the pulses of sea level rise, and what we're seeing with the rapid acceleration of ice melt in Greenland and Antarctica, that we're in for a rapid pulse of sea level rise. We probably have begun it, and it's inevitable and unstoppable because of the warming ocean. And it's probably going to be faster than these models. Let me briefly show you a few of the things that are controlling our global sea level. We're going to continue warming the world's ocean. That will keep expanding the ocean and increasing the heat reservoir. That um, we have acceleration of the alpine uh, glaciers melt, but the big ones are the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet that are melting and uh, the rapidly diminishing Arctic pack ice cover. Okay? And um, these are pictures that Lynn and I took on the right. Uh, reoccupying places my father did back in 59 in the Alps just to show you the mountain glaciers that are rapidly diminishing everywhere in the Europe world. There may be one somewhere that's expanding but no more. This is you know another six or eight inches of sea level rise this century because of this. The big thing though is Greenland and Antarctica. You must go to Greenland. It is so beautiful and it is so disturbing. My wonderful fiance Lynn is standing where the Greenland ice sheet was the year before. And that's shocking to realize how rapidly it is retreating. This is a map of Greenland showing the salmon, how high the summer melt got up on the ice sheet in 1992. And the red by 2005, the white line, if you can see it, is a 2,000 meter contour. The, the ice sheet gets up to over 3,000 meters, over 10,000 feet in elevation. And when we were flying across the first time in 2012 from, uh, from Iceland to Greenland, it was all glistening out of the south side of the plane and the ice. And we were flying to a little sat right here. And, um, but it was melting for the first time for two weeks all of the ice on Green, Greenland ice sheet was melting. That's not, we got there 
And the reason we were there, I wanted to, the surface melt is, is all this Gobi Desert dust and the black soot, the brown soot that had accumulated in the snow is accumulating on the surface and darkening it. So I wanted to sample that. Of course, it snowed the night before, so what we got out of our trip from photography was a nice Christmas card, so there it is. Um, I do recommend when you go that you take somebody with a lot of money so you can rent a very expensive helicopter and get out on the ice sheet. It's really amazing. And uh, you can stay at the Arctic Hotel, a nice four-star hotel in Lewisette. But as we flew around, it's unbelievable. So for 100 miles or more onto the ice sheet, it's covered with rivers and lakes and ponds and 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 uh, not not so little. These are melting their way into the ice sheet. You can see the surface is a little dirty there. And then it goes down these sinkholes, or they call them moulins, that have have gone that go take the water down to the base of the ice sheet. And also, this starts to move, and then it fractures, and it's very fractured now because of the rapid movement. And all these fractures are letting water seep in, and uh, and and soften warm and soften the ice sheet, which is further accelerating its motion. And you can see the dirt on these pictures now. But it's an unbelievable sight. Um, and so as this is happening, it is darkening the surface. And if you live farther north than here, you probably know the good way to melt ice and snow is put dark stuff on. This is not in the models. You know how powerful a melt force that is. It's unbelievable. That's the small story on Greenland, and, and Antarctica really isn't having surface melt yet because it's still a little cold. The atmosphere is warming, but it's still below freezing. The big story on Greenland and Antarctica is that warm ocean water is getting up along all the coasts of Greenland and Antarctica and melting by entering, melting the ice, by entering these deep outlet glacial fjords and going deep in under the ice. This is, uh, I'm sorry. Um, this is uh, at Lulisat, out on the uh, fjord. This is the Jacob Saban Ice Fjord here. And uh, a, a little as a decade ago, the ice sheet, which you can see back there, was here. This is called the trim line, where the, where the vegetation hasn't really had time to grow yet. So this is rapidly retreating. Uh, we, we were out here putting out time-lapse cameras, and uh, and we also flew over to the uh, National Science Foundation camp that was right at the calving face, by the calving face of the glacier. You can see sort of a swale going back here. This is one of the deep shore channels that goes in under the ice sheet. And um, it was unbelievable. In 2012, they were having many more collapsing calving events of the front than they ever had before. This year, at this site, in four days, five miles of ice oozed out. It's just this slurry of fractured material. Oh, darn it. Thank you. The uh, picture... The picture here is uh, the, the Lulisat and the Jacob Shade Ice Shore. The beginning of the ice sheets here. We flew back on a fixed wing back about 80 miles or 100 miles in on the ice sheet to follow this channel that the warm water was getting in underneath. And it was unbelievable. It was this collapsed channel because of the warm water deep below melting and collapsing this. This is where all that ice moved out. You can see how fractured it is. It was about 500 feet lower than the level of the ice sheet when we were there in 2012 and 13. We went out to, to see this, since I talk about it, we took a little boat out among the ice because at the outlet of that fjord, the warm water is coming in. And I have a little, little thermometer to, with a five pound rock that's not on yet and lowered it down. And uh, for the first 100, 120 meters going down, it was just hanging there, the, the line. And then below that, all of a sudden, it took this 20 degree or so swing going into the fjord. That was the incoming warm water flowing in under, to go deep underneath and do melt and come back out. This is happening all the glacial outlets on Greenland and all 
most all the glacial outlets now on Antarctica we're seeing this. You may have read about earthquakes that's associated with these big collapsing events and the stuff rumbling along. Um, but we see this everywhere and since the weight of the ice on Greenland and Antarctica has pushed the land down in some places as much as 3,000 meters below sea level, as this goes in, as melting heads in under the ice, the bottom drops away, so it's, it's, there's no backstop to slow this down. This is rapidly speeding up. Greenland, by the way, has a little over 20 feet of potential sea level rise if it melts. The IPC says we're within a degree. The uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, where the cursor is, could do about uh, another 25 feet, and you don't want to know about the East Antarctic ice sheet. It's huge. We have a total of about 220 feet of ice left. The, uh, the Arctic Ocean is, is floating ice, and it like it. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it matters big time, because that's what kept the Arctic frozen. That's what kept the northern part of the Greenland ice sheet frozen through the summer. That's what kept on the Siberian shelf these methane hydrates, these methane water complexes that are frozen in the sediment and in the permafrost. Uh, frozen. They're melting at a rapid rate releasing methane. And also it is the pack ice in the Arctic Ocean that kept the melting, the permafrost from melting. And as that is melting, it's releasing CO2 and methane also. So this is, this is a big problem, really, because as this goes, we're going to have catastrophic releases of methane. So that's a brief survey, but what it is is showing you that um, we really have something underway with ice melt. A number of geologists say that we were within, uh, well, we have enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now to affect about a 70-foot rise of sea level. And that's very simple. Last time carbon dioxide levels were this high, that's where we were. So what I'm trying to tell you is don't go out to the beach here to figure out your fate. Take a trip up to Greenland or Antarctica if you want to study it. That's where our future is so much dependent on. And it looks like that future is uh, becoming realized very, very distinctly. Let me show you, unfortunately, just focusing on South Florida, again, what we're in for, and, and you can think about all these wonderful things that legal groups think about, like property rights and things like that, and who's to blame for letting me buy this property? Two feet by the middle of the century, four feet later in the century, <coughs> all our barrier islands in the world are gone, period. Um, and we're, we have this porous limestone. Whoever, UM is the University of Miami. Whoever cited it did a nice job. We really appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, we can make it through six feet and maybe eight feet, but by 10 feet, we're starting to get in trouble. And, you know, these are going to happen. I can't imagine that we can turn this around because we have to cool down the ocean to stop this. I hope you get that. Here's, here's Miami-Dade County and Broward. We have this coastal ridge here that we live on, this old oolitic sandbar. Uh, the southern two-thirds of Broward County doesn't have it. Miami International Airport, Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport, just for location, Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant. And one, two, three, four, five, six. There's the end of the century. They, they, it's totally over for many of these, not just the coastal area, the interior areas. And, uh, and there's seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, ten feet. That's where we're headed. Nobody, I can tell you, is going to be greater than six feet. Some people will say it'll be three feet by the end of the century. Well, no, we don't know. But I can't imagine it would be below four or five feet. I just can't with ice melt underway from what happens in the past. And that means we really should be aggressively preparing for this, planning so we're not blindsided when we suddenly can't sell our house where our retirement investment is all locked up. And we become the new Okies, the Florida Okies. What are we, Flokies? I don't know, but it's something. So, you know, we really have a choice of just ignoring this like Rick Scott and others are continuing to do. They say, oh, I'm doing work on 
on sea level, we funded cave research. Well, I like that they funded cave research, but that's not going to solve anything. We have to get our head out of the sand before we drown. But if we plan, we can have, you know, we can really start to make it so the families, the businesses, and the elements of the community can be resilient. We talk about resilience and sustainability. We have to be more sustainable, but for a community to be resilient, you're going to have to pick it up and move it in a lot of places. I don't know if that fits into resilience. The big thing is we never talk about cleaning the land before inundation. And look at all our dumps and industrial sites. Are we going to leave a polluted shallow marine environment for our next generations of children? I hope not. If we don't do this, we risk what we're seeing in the Middle East, which is triggered by climate change by extreme drought, and uh, we're already seeing the results, and um, so the choice is simply ours. Thank you very much. Thank you.